If you ache for truth, goodness, and beauty, if you're hungry for a Christianity with substance and strength, if you long for a faith that's big and bold and biblical and all about Jesus Christ, if you're inspired by the idea of one church that has spanned 20 centuries, 24 time zones, and two hemispheres, enfolding every race, nation, and language, then you're considering Catholicism. Well, welcome back to the podcast. My name is Greg, and I am here with Corey. Hello, everybody. And this is cool because we are resurrecting. I I don't know that it was dead. Resuscitating. Resuscitating. (laughs) We're resuscitating (laughs) book club, which is something that we did for a while, and then we just got busy and got into other topics. And we want to come back with more book club episodes. And so today we're back to book club and Corey, you're going to set it up. Yeah. So way back when we started book club episode 36, if anybody wants to go back to the origin story of book club, we talked about what makes a novel Catholic, what we were going to look at. And I'm not going to rehash all of that. If you're interested, you can go back to that. But basically we're hoping to continue talking about novels that either explicitly have Catholic elements in them or implicitly Catholic themes. And we have one today that has both. And we actually mentioned in that episode that we wanted to do at some point. And that's Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, although it's a little bit embarrassing because this is book club, but neither of us finished the book. And we're just going to talk about the musical <laughs> and the movie. So it, it is, we're it a is bunch embarrassing, of slackers. But, but explain why. <laughs> yes, yes. Greg pulled up some official stats, but... So this is an 1862 novel, a French novel. If 19th century novels, you know that they tend to be very long, much longer than contemporary novels that you'd get from an author writing today. I uh, think Charles Dickens or Leo Tolstoy or War and Peace is the gold standard for long 19th century novels. Les Mis is very close in length to War and Peace, I believe uh, you said. Yeah, so Les Mis, I, I checked, is 520,000 words. And in the Penguin Classics edition is 1,250 pages. War and Peace is 560,000 words. A little bit longer. A little bit longer. But when you're getting into that territory, it's not that big. It's of a like crazy long. <laughs> yes. And a few years ago, I tried reading it. And a few years ago, I thought, I'm embarrassed. I couldn't get through it. So I decided to listen to it. I got an, a download of the Audible audiobook because this was a time when I was doing a lot of driving for my work. Mm-hmm. And I thought, this is perfect. I have these long drives. And the Audible audiobook was 59 hours <laughs> long. <laughs> and, and I was doing a lot of driving, but not that much driving. Yeah. So I, I still hope to get to it one day. I'm, I'm, I have not yet reached middle age. Maybe there's hope for me. There's time. But The novel was adapted into a very popular, very well-received stage musical in the 80s. Originally, actually it was originally in French, and then a very well-known English language adaptation started in London in 1985, and then moved over to the States and Broadway in 87, and has been performed professionally and by community theaters and high schools and everybody. It's very widespread at this point. And then I believe it was 2012 when the musical version of the story was finally filmed. So there was A-list stars cast filming. I I, I think I want to, I hate to interrupt, but I I want people to be careful because if you go back and look for movies, actually they made several movie adaptations of this. There are earlier ones. the earlier ones. ones were bad. The earlier ones are also not based on the musical, so they're based directly on the novel. Yeah. So that's different. And they weren't as great. But the 2012 version starring Hugh Jackman is great. Yeah, it's and good. And it's one of the rare things, rare movies where I say the movie actually is is in some ways as good as the stage play or maybe as the book. I and can't so, highly recommend the movie. I, I can't recommend it highly enough. The movie is a great um, place to start because obviously not everybody has a theater near them that's performing it or, a, or an accessible traveling production. I mean, if you can see it on stage, do that because you, you're doing yourself a favor. It's really good on stage. Um, but if you can't, the movie's a, a good way into it. 
Okay, Corey, now I'm going to challenge you here. Yep. And can you, in 90 seconds or less, summarize what this is about for anybody who has never seen it or heard it? I will rise to the challenge. So Les Mis is essentially the story of a character named Jean Valjean. So this is in early 19th century France. He gets convicted and sent to prison for a small offense, and then he tries to escape, and he, he basically gets trapped in an oppressive justice system and then released on parole. And he has a moment of conversion and tries to remake his life. And then the rest of the novel is his interactions with all of these other characters in a very charged period in French history, culminating in, in 1832, there's this student rebellion in Paris. And so he has an adopted daughter and there's these revolutionaries and it's essentially in all of this, it's his journey of constantly choosing conversion, choosing to do the right, choosing to act in charity and love in this chaotic and often amoral, immoral situation that's swirling around him in, in France at this time. How'd I do? Pretty good. It's hard because once you start trying to give more specifics, then we'll be here for it's half It's a an complicated hour. plot with a lot of characters. Yeah. But it, is, it does follow this one character. And when you'll see the posters for it and all that, it typically shows this young girl. Mm -hmm. And Cosette, that's the adopted daughter. Right. And he really gives his life protecting her. And the reasons why and all that are, are profound. The other thing that people will see about it from the posters and all this is the student revolutionaries waving these big flags and a lot of people. Yeah. That's kinda, probably the most famous imagery from the stage show. Yeah. And I think a lot of people think it's a movie about the French revolution, which it is not about the French revolution. Well, when revolution. you say the French revolution, you always have to ask which one kind of like right. French Republic, which one? <laughs> exactly. And, but there is a, I think so just give a little context. A lot of people do think this is the French revolution. It's not. It is. Why don't you explain? Yeah, real quick. The first French Revolution in the 1780s, that's the one people usually think of with the guillotines and all of that, Robespierre. This is later after Napoleon Bonaparte. This is a student rebellion, a very short-lived revolution in 1832 that was just in Paris. It was some students who were rebelling against the restored monarchy. It didn't go anywhere. And People also confuse it with another one more than a decade later in 1848 that was a, a more successful or more significant revolution in French history. But this is one almost would have been forgotten in some ways if it hadn't been immortalized in this novel. Yeah, and, and we're going to, I think when we get into unpacking it in this episode and the next, when we talk about it, because we'll, the significance of that, mm -hmm. uh, I think we're going to discuss yeah, that. Yeah. But just to frame it, it was a student rebellion that lasted all of 24 hours. Yeah. It was June 5 to June 6, <laughs> and it only encompassed about two blocks, like literally two city blocks. They set city. up barricades and at, at, tried at, to at take the end stand. Of, at, Yeah, at the end of two intersections and, and the futility, like a damp sparkler fizzling out yeah, of the yeah. thing is, I think, part of the theme. Yes, I, and yeah. We'll, we'll get into that. All right. So good job summarizing it, setting it up. And now we're going to, in this episode, this conversation, what we want to do is talk about what we think are the big ideas or, or big themes mm -hmm. that are in it. And then in our next conversation, we're going to share kind of our favorite moments or favorite scenes, or favorite lines. Yeah. Okay. And again, for all of you who maybe have heard it, you can go out and get it on any of the streaming services, Apple Music, whatever. You can download the Broadway stage soundtrack, or again, I can't highly recommend enough the Hugh Jackman movie version. Yeah, and if you're listening just to the soundtrack, you might want to have the Wikipedia plot synopsis or something, just because then you'll know who's talking at any given time. But the movie, obviously, that's not a problem. Okay. So let's do this thing about the big ideas and the big themes. Mm -hmm. And we gamed this out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm going to do is share kind of my journey with this show or the story, or this book, whatever, and how I have, my understanding of it has changed over the last 40 years. Because in a lot of ways, my understanding or my takeaways from this show have tracked my road to Rome, mm -hmm. my conversion story. Yeah. So it kind of charts it. I can look back at the different times in my conversion to Catholicism, I picked up on different themes. Mm -hmm. So I first 
saw this show way back right when it first came to the U.S. in 1987. It must have been like 88 or 89, but a year or so after that, my wife and I had an opportunity to go see the Broadway touring show. And it was new to me. And then I was so enthralled with it. I just I fell in love with it instantly. And I bought way back then, Corey, you're a young man, but back then we used to have these things called compact discs, mm-hmm. like CDs. And right. I actually, we were bought, still using cassette tapes when I was a when kid. you were a child. I, yes. When you were yeah, a child, I remember CDs. <laughs> but, uh, but I got the CDs, and then I like wore out the CDs in my car CD <laughs> player for several years. But back then, when I first saw it, I was a seminarian in a Calvinist seminary, and I loved it. But what I picked up on in it, uh, my takeaway from it, was this sort of Protestant contrast between law and grace. Yeah. Okay. So. For Protestants, you look in the book of Romans and Paul, St. Paul, St. Paul, but as Protestants, we don't call him St. Paul, we call him just Paul. Paul contrasts in Romans this idea of law and the Old Testament law, the Old Covenant, and he contrasts it with the New Covenant of grace in Christ and how the covenant of law, the law draws us down, it shackles us, and the covenant of grace frees us. And I saw in Les Mis this remarkable contrast between the police inspector, the policeman who chases uh, Valjean for his whole story, Inspector Gerard, that he represented that law that Paul talks about, that Old Mm -hmm. Testament, and that the story of Valjean was the story of grace. So I remember when I first got to seminary in a Calvinist church, actually using this as a sermon illustration on multiple occasions where I said, hey, if you want to understand Romans chapter three or whatever, all this law of grace stuff, you look at the contrast between Inspector Gervais and the convict Jean Valjean. So that was the thing that I drilled down on or was attracted to or picked, took out of it as mm-hmm. a Protestant. Yeah. And, and that is a very prominent theme. I, th- I think from a Protestant perspective, it's easy to misunderstand is probably the, the best way to put it. I, do, I don't think it's like a deliberate twisting of the theme, but there's something of a misunderstanding there because I don't think it's in, in the musical or in Catholic theology that it's as simple as just law bad, grace good, or that Javert simply represents law and Valjean simply represents grace. I think there's, you, the, the theme of grace operative in Valjean's life is extremely important in it, but I think the tragedy of Javert's character is that he misunderstands the relationship between God's justice and mercy, or between law and grace. It's not that law is bad, but he doesn't see a place for mercy and forgiveness. And he is what we might call legalistic. He thinks that simply following the law to the letter is what saves, and that there really isn't any room for coming back if one falls from that grace. I agree with you 100% about Catholic theology on that. Mm -hmm. My point is when I was a Protestant, that's not how Protestants see it. That's not Protestant theology. So for those who are listening who are Protestants and you see the same theme, both Luther and Calvin agreed that the law, the Old Testament law, what Paul's talking about, Romans, is the teacher of sin, right? It's that which shackles us. We are shackled by the Old Covenant. Mm-hmm. And we are set free by the new covenant. And that's, this is the Romans road, right? This, yeah, is, yeah. this is central Lutheran Calvinist reformational theology. So I agree with you, that's not Catholic theology, but I think what attracted me to this show in my Protestantism was picking that theme out. Sure, sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Then I, again, this was charts my conversion story because go forward a few years, it's now like the early, mid-1990s, and I'm starting to get a little more intrigued with Catholicism. I'm still a Protestant pastor, but there's a little thing in the back of my head, and I, I'd begun to be drawn initially to the Church of History because I was having the opportunity to travel some. And so I was seeing these cathedrals, and I was seeing monasteries, and I was seeing stained glass windows, and I began to touch and feel some of this and started to go, wow, this is the, the Church of History, which was the Catholic Church. And as I was attracted to the Church of History, the Catholic Church, now I'm still listening to my Les Mis soundtrack in the car, but I'm starting to pick up on things in the show that I didn't pick up on 
at first when I was so into the law versus grace thing. And I remember listening to the soundtrack with this sort of new understanding or new attraction to Catholicism with the church of history thing. Yeah, yeah. And I was struck by one, one particular thing. So when the bishop rescues Jean Valjean from being arrested by giving him the candlesticks, mm -hmm. he has this line where he says, by the witness of the martyrs, by the passion and the blood, I have raised you out of darkness. I have bought your soul for God. Now, when the guy sings that, it's real stirring, the music. Oh, yeah. And I just remember driving in my car. I was living in Los Angeles at the time. And I was actually, long story, driving to and from sometimes this Catholic monastery on the edges of L.A. because I was starting to get spiritual direction there. And so I'm driving to my spiritual direction or back from it. And I'm listening, by the witness of the martyrs, by the passion and the blood. Can't sing. But, Cover album coming soon. Yeah, I was like... Oh my gosh, I'm like I'm, I'm drawn into this whole thing because that, that's not Protestant language. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to think about the witness of the martyrs, the passion and the blood, you know, which obviously partly refers to the Eucharist. But, you know, in my state, I was like, man, it just, it opened up like a portal to me, this window into the historic church of 20 centuries and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God, that's what I began to pick up on and see the show as a dominant theme of Les Mis. The, just this kind of, I don't know, massive gateway for me into all that the Catholic Church represented over the last 2,000 years. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, don't have much to add to that one. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Then fast forward another five or six, eight years. I'm getting super serious about Catholicism mm -hmm. and I'm reading more Catholic stuff and beginning to study it real intently as I know you were on that same period. And that's when I began to pick up on another theme or big dominant idea in there, which and I'm embarrassed to say is so obvious. It's like right on the surface of the thing, but I didn't have the language, the vocabulary, the framework as a Protestant to understand it. And that was the concept of redemptive suffering. You wouldn't have had the category really. Yeah. yeah. The category of redemptive suffering. As I got older, I saw that <laughs> as you get older, Corey, you start to see how life beats people up, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. including me and everybody around me, right? You just get older and you just see more people getting beaten up by life. And coming out of the evangelical world I was living in, evangelicals don't have a category for that. I mean, you pray that God rescues you from all this, right? You pray mm -hmm. that the footsteps thing, God will, Jesus will carry me through this, or the song, Jesus will take the wheel or something, or when you pray that you get out of it, that God heals you, or he fixes your financial situation, or he rescues your family. But, but I began at that time to listen to Les Mis and start to realize that in life, you know, not all your dreams come true. And that's a big part of this show. Mm -hmm. The story is it shows how for several characters, and we'll get into that, you know, your dreams don't always come true. And sometimes your reward for doing good things is to have bad things happen to you, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you pray for your life to be better, it, it doesn't get better. And as I grew in my understanding of Catholic spirituality, I began to lean into the truth that, that God doesn't always make our problems go away, but that he's able to bring good out of that. And that if we lean into that, if we cooperate and embrace that, I began to see how Les Mis illustrates that suffering can redeem us and it can redeem those around us. Yeah. And you see that in a number of characters, but most prominently Valjean, because he is subject to these sufferings and these setbacks in life. And because he continues to choose to be faithful, continues to cooperate with God's grace and do the right thing, act, act in God's love, it, it changes him. It, it makes him a good man. It makes him a holy man. And it, it brings about good for the people around him, for Cosette, his adoptive daughter, and for, for other people in, in the plot of the novel as, as well, that his sufferings bear good fruit. It's not just something to, to be gotten through, 
but something that God works through, a, a means through which God works in his life. He starts the story penniless, obviously, because he's a prisoner, mm-hmm. poor, penniless prisoner. And he ends the story when he dies, a poor, penniless guy living in a convent, and he can't leave the convent, it'll be arrested. Mm-hmm. And throughout everything he goes through, he still, he starts the story and he ends the story still a poor man. But he's so rich in the end, and he dies a rich man in the eyes of God Mm -hmm. and in the eyes of the people around whom we count count the most. And we'll get into this, I think, in the next episode with some of our favorite scenes and moments. But when he dies, the people around him, their lives have been enriched. Yeah. And he dies a, a rich man in their eyes. And so as I, again, as I progressed down my road to Rome, my understanding grew of Catholic spirituality. And, and that was the thing that kept coming through to me was like, wow, this is a story of what redemptive suffering is. And I don't have the category or the, the language for that in coming out of my theological tradition. But that mm-hmm. began to the thing that I was, what resonated with me. Yeah, absolutely. And then it's only in the last couple of years and I don't know whether this is just a function of me becoming an old man, like your perspective changes as you, as you go. And so maybe this is just the perspective of, of me in my, in the beginning of my, what is it, dotage or whatever. But You're not quite there. I, it's getting closer every day, Corey, <laughs> let me tell you. But currently, I think I see Les Mis as a profound illustration or story or whatever parable about the value of life. And I don't mean life in some idealistic aggregate way, like humanity, but of a life, the individual life. In fact, I think I now see lame is that the dominant theme, in my opinion, what I draw of it now, the dominant theme of the story is it contrasts the folly of idealizing humanity in this big picture aggregate way rather than valuing and loving individual people, Mm -hmm. including yourself. I think Les Mis is the story of a person, the journey of a soul. I I think it really is now, I think it's the journey of a human soul. Yeah, Jean Valjean and how his life is saved, his soul is saved, and because his life and soul is valuable and worth saving, and somebody saves it, he then begins to value others and begins to save them. Again, not by going up on the barricade and saving human- France or humanity or something, but by literally saving other people. Mm-hmm. It's the value of the individual life. And I now think, I've come to this profound insight here, that of this whole two, two and a half hour show, on all the songs and all the great moments and all the great lines and the whole thing, I think I have found like the Rosetta Stone. I think I found the, the, the one line in the entire two and a half hour show that I think is the key to unlocking what it's about. Mm-hmm. And this is just me now, my. But I think the key line in the whole musical is when the student revolutionaries are sitting in their whatever, it's like a meet, cafe. Yeah, cafe. They meet in this bar or whatever to plan their revolution. And they're sitting in the bar having drinks or cafe having drinks and planning there to to put up the barricades. And the one character, Marius, comes in and he's pining because he fell in love with this girl, Cosette. And the leader of the student revolutionaries says to him, because he's not paying attention. Like they're all like, like, we're going to build the barricades. He's distracted because we're going to build the barricades and do all this kind of stuff. And he's just like sitting in the corner, like, you know, simping and stuff about, (laughs) (laughs) about his girlfriend. Right. And the student uh, leader says to him, who cares about your lonely soul? We strive towards a larger goal. Our little lives don't count at all. Now, when you see the musical or watch the film, that's sung in a way that's super string, like in the background, trumpets and stuff, the orchestra swells, our little lives don't count at all kind of thing. And now I think that's the key to understanding this whole thing. That line is the key line 
but it's a negative, right? It's in reverse. Because the whole thrust of the story and the actual character arcs contradict it. Yeah. I, I think that the major theme of the show is that that, that line is wrong mm -hmm. and that that line is thrown out there. It's the key because the whole story is to contradict that. The theme of Lame is, I think now, is that our lonely souls do matter. Mm -hmm. That there is somebody or people who care about your lonely soul. And that larger goals are often illusions. And that our little lives do count for everything. And it starts with God caring about Valjean's soul through, through the bishop's redemption, redemptive action through him. And then Valjean, through his life, caring about individual people, caring about Fantine and Cosette and Marius, that, that, those actions, those acts of love towards individuals in the musical are what actually make the world a better place. They actually improve people's lives. Whereas you then see the revolution go nowhere, actually just cause more death and destruction, both to the people who are trying to start the revolution and to the people around. So you have that core contrast at the heart of the, the story. Yeah, I think that in the end, Les Mis is about love. And again, not love in some sort of gauzy, idealistic way, but it's like what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians you know, 13, when he talks about love is everything. It doesn't matter what you accomplish mm -hmm. in this world. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I can... I can speak in the tongues of men and angels. I can accomplish all things. I can change the world. I can hoist the barricades and overturn France. I can do this. I can do that. I, but if I don't have love, it's pointless. It's empty. It's nothing. But I, my mind is also drawn to like the epistle of St. James, like faith without works is dead, that it's the working out of love in concrete actions. As you say, it's not some, just some idea. Valjean doesn't have a vague affection for other people. Like, he has to do the hard work of raising the adoptive daughter, of dragging Marius through the sewers and, and try to try and save his life. Like it, it's very concrete, difficult acts that are giving up a selfishness of him and acting for the good of others. It's loving your neighbor. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is Jesus's parables, right? This is the good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. When the priests and the Levites walked by on the other side of the road, he didn't just love humanity. He loved a particular person. Right. He helped the guy up and took him to the inn and paid his bill. And, and I'll say this too. I think when we look around the world today, and it seems like there are so many problems that are beyond human scale to solve. I know whether it's global economic stuff or conflicts about the planet or climate change or whatever you want to get wrapped up in, or the AI, how the Terminators are going to take over the world. There's so many things you could sit and just worry about that they're all beyond and they're overwhelming and they're all beyond what you can do anything about. And you just become this pawn in this massive global thing that you can't control. And I think what Les Mis says is, you're right, you can't control all those things. What you can do is you can love it with concrete action a person who happens to be close to you. Mm -hmm. So again, to your point, the bishop didn't go find Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean stumbled in front of the <laughs> bishop's door, and he invites him in for the night, right? and then he steals the silver and all that stuff. And it's brought back and the bishop says, here's somebody that God has brought to my doorstep. I'm going to love. And then Valjean, uh, he has a woman working in his factory and unbeknownst to him, she's unjustly fired from her job and ends up destitute and in the most desperate circumstances you can imagine. We'll talk about that yeah, yeah. in the next conversation. He didn't choose Fontaine, but here was somebody who needed him. And so he loved, practiced love, and the same thing with the child. And again, this kid Marius, I can tell you, you've got daughters. I had a daughter. When some boy comes sniffing around the property towards your daughter, your first instinct is to beat him with a stick and get him away. <laughs> he didn't choose Marius, but when he finds out that Marius is dying on the barricade, he goes into the sewers and brings him back. Not because when somebody is in front of you, you love them. 
And I think that in all of those cases, Valjean's lonely soul mattered. His little life counts. Fantine's lonely soul, her little life counted. Marius's and Cosette's little lives mattered and counted. And I think the message of Les Mis to you and I and everybody else is that your little lonely soul and your little life matters. And around you are lonely souls and little lives that count and matter as well. And if we can't fix the big things in this world, we can at least devote ourselves to those little things. Yeah, no, is that I, making sense? Yeah, I, I think that's right, and it, and it's not to say that there's no role for like structural change or justice or that. It, it's not against that, but I th- I think it's about the mindset of how the individual affects the world. The the revolutionary mindset that's portrayed by these students who set up the barricade is that I change the system typically through violence, and then that helps individuals. Whereas the Christian mindset is exactly flipped the opposite. It's that I care and I love about and I love and I take care of individuals and that has a cumulative effect that can change society that can change the world yeah I think that's right and not to lose sight of that this is where you can just I, I think we, we can so do one of two things I think we can either become overwhelmed by the problems of the world in mm-hmm. which case we become frozen Or, as you say, we can become enraptured by these things and caught up in idealistic movements where we believe that we can bring about the kingdom of God by collective... By the point of a sword. the point of a sword or through these kinds of things. But I think Les Mis always just reminds us that right around you, right in front of you, are things that you can do to change one person's life, including your own. and. And in a sense, in the end, that's what God holds you accountable to. Mm. I, I think about the parable of the sheep and the goats, right? Where at the end, you're going to stand before the Lord in judgment, and he's going to say, what did you do for those around you? And you go, I don't know. And you go, but that, in some sense, that's what matters. Lonely souls and little lives count. And so anyway, as I've gotten older, again, this has charted my journey to the Catholic Church, how I feel about the show, because I became fascinated with it way back in the late 80s, is that I moved from seeing it as this parable about, or illustration, or something of Protestant theology about law and grace, to seeing the, the historical church portrayed in it, being attracted by that, to living into redemptive suffering. But now I just think it's a story about love. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's that it theme is the most important theme and envelops all the rest. And you see the other themes through the lens of that one. Yeah. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to stop the recorder and we're going to come back with episode two of this two-part book club deal on Les Mis or show club or (laughs) movie club or whatever this is, story club. And we're going to share kind of some of our favorite scenes or moments from the show and Mm -hmm. why there are favorite scenes and moments. So if you're listening, uh, thanks for joining us. and I. If you haven't seen the movie, the 2012 movie uh, with Hugh Jackman, then you can find it on you know, all the movie streaming services. I found it on Amazon Prime the other night to rewatch it to remind myself of it. You can find the Broadway soundtrack if it, on online streaming music services or whatever. Go ahead and take a listen to those or watch that before we do the next episode, and it'll also remind you of some of those scenes. And in the meantime, would you rate and review the podcast and all things we normally say? Send us an email or send us a message, consideringcatholicism at gmail.com or go to consideringcatholicism.com and leave a message there. Send us your questions, your stories, your comments, and your suggestions for future book club episodes. And as always, would you support the podcast so we can keep it going? And you can do that through the links in the show notes or on the website. And so we're going to hit the pause button. We'll come back with our favorite scenes and moments from Les Mis. It's going to be good.